This is a manifesto against box-ticking habits in simulation, or why compliance should never be the last box that we tick. In an August 2021 IBIPSA webinar on model QA QC, a number of speakers presented ideas about simulation model quality, and then the discussion opened up to the audience. Some of the speakers were from what I call the compliance camp. Others were from the let's automate simulation camp. And I was coming from a very different place. As a paranoid consultant developer concerned with how we might use simulation to answer the strange and wonderful questions that arise in the design process. I recently rewatched that session. And actually, I think the webinar exposed a number of habits within the simulation community. Compliance has its place. A committee of the wise decides on a methodology. Software vendors encode these methods, provide a button to run it. And quite a few practitioners seem to think if they tick the compliance box, this results in a good building for their clients. This webinar invites us to think again. To think again about the performance issues that are not part of compliance methods. To think again about what's actually happening when we press the we make compliance easy button in the simulation tool. So next is the actual webinar session. Okay, so um, I'm the guy with lots of different hats and at the moment I'm being my paranoid consultant set and developer. So I use simulation to understand the performance well enough to actually tell somebody else a really good story about their design. That means I need to actually get in there and sort out what in the world's going on with this thing um, so that we get beyond the standard sort of reports. Um, so I really want to tell a story that's robust. I really want to deliver useful insights. And um, so I've spent a rather long time evolving tools uh, to deliver help deliver those robust stories. Um, I am easily frustrated by the tools I use and happily I'm in the position of actually going in and I can go and change the software, recompile and get new facilities in to meet the needs of whatever the current project is or the, you know, that sort of stuff. So um, let's start a story about, of all things, brack wax figures in the Victoria and Albert Museum. Long time ago, in a galaxy far, far away, um, was asked, uh, somebody wanted to make a, a uh, exhibition of wax figures in the Victoria Alberts, and it was scheduled for the summer, and somebody asked the question, how many hours do we have if the environmental controls fail during this hot summer week? How many hours do we have before these artifacts are at risk? These are one of a kind things, they get lost, there's no replacement for it, so no pressure. We all agreed, nobody knew the answer to this. They commissioned three different assessment teams to go and look at it. And um, so really pedantic discovery about what is the nature of this thing we're trying to assess, really looking at it um, and then saying, okay, and then uh, so we really wanted to understand the essence of what we wanted to simulate. How often in practice do we actually do that? Pedantic review of the thermophysics in play, really imagining what kinds of things are going on here so that we made an informed selection of the tools and solvers we're using, rather than just saying, hey, I'm doing a good job because I've ticked every box that the tool offers. So we wanted to design our model so we really captured the essential characteristics of it. So it's to me, how much detail is actually needed to answer the question? Where is it that that detail needs to be placed? Um, and so how much the building actually needs to be modeled to answer the client's question? Can I design assessments to capture unintended consequences? For example, can I identify patterns of boundary conditions and reuse that, that are very useful to explore to understand the nature of the building. Can I toss some gremlins into the assessment 
that randomly fault different kinds of things in the building to illuminate points of failure. So beliefs, design teams have all kinds of beliefs how stuff works. A few, of, some of those beliefs actually be true, but we can use simulation to test these beliefs. We could use simulation to explore the robustness of the design. Now to the crux of it, people running simulation have all kinds of beliefs themselves. Beliefs about their tools, beliefs about their working practices, beliefs about their model making abilities. And again, some of those beliefs are actually true. But well, I submit that there are many practitioners who are actually quite poor observers of what actually is happening in buildings. Many practitioners place an unfounded trust in their tools. It didn't blow up. Therefore, it must be right. Many practitioners believe that compliance equates to a delightful place to live or work. Compliance is for a specific purpose. You go and read the fine print on lots of compliance tools and they say, please, this was not designed, it's not intended to be used as a design tool. So one antidote for unfounded belief is QAQC. Helps us gain confidence that our models are fit for purpose, that our working practices have the possibility to deliver useful information, and the biggie is without us having staff casualties along the way. It forces us out of our comfort zone. It makes explicit our modeling goals. It encourages us to document and defend our assumptions. It encourages the discovery of unintended consequences of the design process. And when we discover those unintended confidence, uh, consequences, I treat it as this is a preview of opportunities to make the design better. I found something while I was exploring this thing and all of a sudden I can report to the client, hey, we weren't contracted to do that, but here's something we noticed along the way. And so, and of course, QAQC is about catching the usual suspects. John, we did pass the five minute mark. We actually had okay. six minute mark. Okay, fine. So model fit for purpose might be more or less complex than the easy paths that tools provide. Let's start small and high resolution. Everything in this thing is thermally active. It's actually real radiation view factors. Everything, there is paper in the cabinets, uh, books on the shelves, sensors at each uh, point, uh, each workstation on there. That's a small portion of, a, of an office building, but I can answer lots and lots of questions from that. So let's create models that work for the employees uh, of that company. Let's go beyond compliance and have assessments that essentially run forever. It, you start it and it just keeps tossing out random gremlins to see how a building might fail its occupants. And then when it finds a failure, that's what we'd like to do about it. So to make it work better, it starts before your fingers hit the keyboard. Name stuff so you own the model. Don't assume some magic button will support the creation of delightful spaces. Admit that compliance tools sometimes make rubbish design tools. It's a team thing. Get your colleagues to look over your shoulder. My big thing is spend a lot of time living with your model so that you understand the beastie get proficient at scanning the model contents reports, pester vendors to make those reports better, and physically test the building and its digital twin before you hand the thing over. Here's an example of a thing I did yes, uh, a couple of days ago. Uh, basically, I'd mon there was an old building that was monitored. I made a digital twin of it. I embedded that monitoring into the model and tried out different kinds of things that were slightly unknown uh, in order to figure out what was going on. And that's oh, John, eight and that's it. And here is the manifesto. Design teams should move beyond the comfort zone of compliance. Our box ticking habits are not always in the best interest of our clients. 
we need to go further to deliver insights to design teams that might truly result in delightful buildings. Do you agree? Do you disagree?